Good morning, good afternoon for all those who have joined us right now. Uh, I'm here with Josh Hagen. We're going to kind of wait for another minute to wait for some more attendees to attend, uh, to show up and log in, and then we'll get rolling. So just kind of hang tight, please. Again, we are uh, just kind of hanging tight until everyone signs in. I'm here with Josh Hagen. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. All right, it looks like everyone is signed in and that's gonna be showing up. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Thomas Dewey, and I work with Sparta Science as a customer success manager. Uh, this is our fourth episode in our series on sustaining the human weapon system. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Josh Hagen. Uh, Josh has over 20 years of experience as a researcher in biosensor technology. Over the past 11 years, Josh has been working in the field of human performance where he has become a subject matter expert in the validation of human performance technology. Josh received his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, master's degree in materials engineering, and PhD in materials engineering, all while attending University of Cincinnati. Josh has become the go-to expert for practitioners in the tactical performance setting to make sense of this recent explosion of human performance technologies. Josh, thanks for chatting with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's like to, it's like to chat. So I was preparing for this uh, chat with you during the week, and last night I was scrolling through LinkedIn, and I heard found this organization called the Sports Technology Research Network, and they just put out a white paper, um, kind of about how to maybe assess technology. So I thought, like, oh, this is perfect for kind of our conversation. So before we hop into the questions that I kind of prepared for this uh, talk. I wanted to quickly go over maybe two, um, and may have you have you speak about two paragraphs that um, I thought were interesting within this uh, white paper. The first one was talking about kind of the different stakeholders in um, technology and how it gets you know validated, what works well, and what I thought was interesting was the last sentence of this paragraph. Um, so I'll go into it. So lastly, but not certainly not least. In the race of competitive advantage, it's the players that often have a limited voice in how sports technology is used to monitor and intervene on their training and performance. Is there any, could you speak about that? Maybe how, best practices for that and, you know, how that works within the military with, you know, DOD, which you've done and also uh, within athletics. Yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, I was pretty excited when that white paper came out. So I'm uh, well aware of that group. Like it's, a really hard hitting group to put that together. And they, as you can see from the timeline in there, like they put a lot of time and thought and effort into that. And I think it's critical because they're, like you mentioned, there's just been an explosion of technology over the last really 10 years, but I think exponentially over maybe the last five, I think we're all privileged to work in that area because it's, it's opportunity and scaling of being able to do these things, but we're absolutely at the point. I mean, probably we're a couple of years ago where we've got to have a framework behind it because there's so much out there. Um, yeah, that really, that statement really resonates with me. Um, and so I came into this whole thing years and years ago, I'm engineer by background. So I'm just dorky and I want all of the data and all the things and all the devices. And that's how, that's how I went into it is like, let's put all the things on without thinking about the human being that's putting these things on. Um, luckily I've become a, you know, wiser and grayer over the years of, and I'm just, man, I'm so privileged to work with, you know, your old organization, tons of across the different services, uh, athletics and, you know, pro and NCAA. And I say that because like the perspectives I get from all those groups is, is awesome. Like just the stories you hear from people about how they're doing things and those anecdotes, like I try to file all those away and then within that get past practices. But to that point, like the whole reason we're doing any of this is to help the athlete service member, firefighter, surgeon, like whoever, and really all of this stuff is available for all these people. So we've got to keep that number one priority. It's like, and that's what we definitely Ohio State, like it is a student athlete 
focus, like what is everything we can do within our power to help that student athlete succeed and successes, lots of different facets, right? It could be performance on the field, in the pool, uh, on the rink, wherever it could be, uh, like keeping them healthy, right? Uh, uninjured, high quality of life, all, all that good stuff. But data transparency, I think is critical here um, in this. I mean, there's just a number of groups that we've worked with where, where that became critical of just like showing them their own data back. Like it can't just go into some repository where they never see it, especially, I mean, as simple as it is, as like wellness questionnaires and we get hammered for these all the time. Uh, when it's not done well is when they just fill it out and don't ever hear from anybody about it. And there's no feedback whatsoever. Um, one way to help with that is to instantly visualize the data back to them. That's uh, effective, that's scalable. What really helps, um, and this was taught to me by Steve Tastian, um, high performance manager for US soccer and Columbus crew. And uh, he, he's amazing, but this was something I was in with the crew with him and like seeing the way that he utilized his wellness data and would look at it and have a conversation with the athlete about it. And just like a, a normal, just like how you doing? Um, I saw that you, you know, you said this about hamstrings, everything all right, or you didn't get good sleep last night. And that was the nugget that he gave to me was like, you have to show that you like he cares about that information. You have to show that you care about it. You have to talk to the athlete about it. Um, that's one. Uh, the other what we're doing a ton at Ohio State is just trying to educate the athletes on what these things are. So something as simple as like a sleep technology. Let's train them up so they know what it looks like. But then we also design infographics that are around the facilities of uh, can be nuggets of just like what is sleep efficiency. Uh, what can you do about it? Like something that just kind of resonates to say like, oh, okay, I get it. Something like uh, assessments, if it's uh, movement competency or force plates or whatever, like right at the station, like we've got something that's like, this is biomechanical force. And this is what this, like and that gets very complicated, right? Like, what is this metric? What does that mean? Here's how it resonates. You as an athlete, here out of, here's how it resonates. Um, did the same thing with the Marine Corps, same exact scenario. They're doing lots of those assessments. Like here's what it is. Here's how it makes you a better Marine. Uh, something inspirational, like here's a leaderboard. Like if you want to be in the top 90th percentile, here's your score just so they, they resonate to it. So I think the more we can just be transparent, give them that information back, talk to them about it, show that you're using it too. Um, Cause that's what I've seen uh, historically with some different groups of workload monitoring, like why am I wearing this thing? Like training is going to be just as hard tomorrow as it was <laughs> yeah. today. Nothing's going to change. Um, yeah. which may be the case, but if, if in that scenario, cause you may not have control over that, how can you use that information? Uh, I think university of Kentucky told me this, uh, with their catapult data right after, uh, practice and Chris Morris, uh, told me this a number of years ago, like their nutritionist would get that information right away in action that in smoothies, nutrition cow, like saying like, Hey man, your workload was a lot higher than we expected. Here's some extra calories. So simple things yeah. like that, that can say like, Oh, got it. I'm wearing this thing you did that thing. It's going to make me better. Yeah. Uh, the, and the, another paragraph that was in the, the beginning, um, and I won't read the whole thing. I'll just kind of summarize it. Uh, but it starts off with the responsibility to confirm technology quality of the product ultimately rests with the manufacturer. So there's kind of, you know, some incentives for the manufacturer maybe to lie and it's hard for them to, you know, there's no gold standard a lot of times for them to test against. And then with the competition and financial concerns, the manufacturers are rarely going to disclose the technology, like the technology they're using and like algorithms. Um, and then it goes to researchers like yourself to try to keep up with this technology. But by the time that you, you know, produce a paper and gets go through peer review, that technology is now old. Um, so how are you keeping up with that? How is that like, how does that working in the research world um, just kind of Quick little overview on that for me. Yeah, you got to have several several levels to this, and I, um, it definitely it starts with the manufacturer, and like they have to ensure that they are making a quality product. Um, you know, I, you have to take it for what it's worth, right? So, like most companies have white papers, you know, on their websites, and you just have to understand what a white paper is, and it is. I, I would say Polar does probably the best job of this of any company. Uh, also make that's this this disclaimer that probably should, like I don't have any financial ties to any company. I'm agnostic. May the best technology win always. Yeah. Uh, I will I use what I use now, but I'm happy to change to something that's better. Um, but just kind of seeing like yeah, Polar, you can go on their website and download white papers for every algorithm, everything they've got. Like they're transparent. Now 
they're creating that information, right? Which is great. They have PhDs in physiology and like, I have trust that they're doing good work, but that's where that next level comes. That's okay. First level of trust. That's great. Next level of trust is you start digging in as a practitioner, as an engineer, as a scientist, and see if you agree with the things that they came up with. Um, the next level is peer-reviewed publications, uh, which you have to be very careful uh, the way you read these as well, because like that is kind of the scientific uh, checkbox. So the peer review process is you have your scientist do an experiment, submit it to a journal, a very painful process. Then you have a bunch of other scientists that just rip it to shreds. That's the peer review process. And then, then it gets in there. Um, so generally there should be decently high quality information that lands in a journal, but then you have to look at like, were the authors, uh, did they, do they work for the companies, which again is okay. Um, but then that just is like one other layer of like, okay, again, I, I can't just take this for face validity. I've got to do my own investigate. And that's kind of what we're trying to tell everybody is like, there's plenty of information out there that we can kind of know uh, generally what direction products are heading in, but you still have to do your own t and &E. um, To the, the comment about the pace, and this is exactly why, um, you know, a couple of years ago with some DOD funded research that we're doing, this was a whole purpose of us pitching to them in this consumer human performance space, like we have to execute validation studies at a pace that's so fast, we will publish the results by, by the time that paper gets out, which is probably six months after the experiments were done, just because it's not a quick process. For sure, the firmware is out to date. Um, the hardware might be, the company might be out of business. That's pretty severe. <laughs> um, I've actually had, I, I've been sitting on a paper from a couple of years ago. I, I can't publish it because half the devices are no longer companies. Um, it's my fault for not getting it out. But, um, so that's what we pitched to the DOD is like, we've got an agile test and evaluation. Um, we've got access to lots of different subjects and a great IRB to where if something new, and we had this example with Aura when they released their um, like daily heart rate measures um, in the Gen 3 ring, like within one month of them releasing that, we actually had validation data that was sent internal to the DOD a month after getting that device in our hand. Um, so obviously that's not a public document. It does become public once it's published, um, but that's how we've, but I, like these other organizations, you know, can certainly do that internally. NBA does a fantastic job at it, um, of getting that information out internally at the pace at which these things are um, advancing, because I mean, that's a great thing is like new hardware, new algorithms, new things are, are happening at all times, but that's why we've got a team that just constantly wears all of the things. And we, you know, we test ourselves, we test subjects. Um, but the quicker we can get that out there, the better. And just again, being transparent. So we're, I consider us the consumer reports of technologies. And if if you're a company and you sell a thing and you show that data to the consumer, uh, we're going to validate. Like as long as it has units and it's understandable, and we have a way to test it, we're going to validate it and we're going to publicly uh, report the results. Just to again make sure that our practitioners, our athletes, have trust in that information. It comes in handy a lot too because I get. Uh, hit up constantly, especially with uh, like a lot of the coaches um, at Ohio State and other places of like, hey, our athletes saw this thing. What do you think about it? Or I had one the other day of, uh, hey, I've got athletes wearing two different things. They're giving different values. What can I tell them? And then I can just pull up that paper or have a conversation and say like, yeah, uh, it's not the same. This one is more accurate based on this data. Um, but again, just knowing that things are getting better and better. So we want to just give everything a fair shot at all times get that information out there. Like we don't care who wins, but the most accurate device should win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of goes into now because of the questions that I prepared for today. Um, what do you, what are the roles that you see biosensors play within the monitoring and measuring of your performance? Like, what do you think is important? You talked about sleep a second ago. You talked about catabolt. Like where, what other technology do you see in improving that human performance space? Yeah, it's a, other, many of other people have said this, but it's another tool in the toolbox. And like as sports scientists and as, you know, practitioners just trying to, you know, really taking the data for what it is. Like we don't, I don't want my vision years and years ago when I stepped foot in your facility was like, this is a lot of years ago, right? Uh, this was, man, we're going to have one crazy sensor that measures everything and I'm going to give, give you a score and that score is going to be right. And that's, man, hopefully we get there at some point, try quarter, I don't know what it is. It's just more complicated than that. And we don't ever want, ever, ever, ever want to replace a practitioner. We don't want to re replace eyes on, but what we want to do is like, how can you use that information to 
help you with your job? Like, can it make you a more effective practitioner? Can it make you a more mindful athlete, mindful human being? Um, so I think that's, that's really the big part of it is just knowing, knowing what it's good for, knowing what it's not good for, making, making sure it fits in your philosophy. Um, there's not going to be one thing that just tells you everything. Like it, there's just, I think it can add some context to some things. Um, like, especially with workload monitors, like if, so say you only have a recovery wearable, like a sleeper, a recovery wearable, and you don't have anything measuring load and you're only looking at recovery data. If your recovery is in the tank, uh, when you wake up in the morning, you don't know why, like that could be a planned event, right? Maybe yesterday's training was by design, super hard. Something happened yesterday and that can help dictate your plan. But if, you, if you're missing that information, you won't know that. Uh, maybe the context of the, the coach will already know that and you have to kind of take that into consideration. Um, but I think as you, you know, the sports science model um, in a school that NSCA has a certification and a textbook and there's just tons of literature out there, like, it's a very specific model that you can, you know, load monitoring, recovery monitoring, assessments, like all of these things are very achievable by a lot of people. Um, but I think it's just understanding, like, um, this is really the big thing is like, let's not work from the product backwards anymore. There's lots of products out there, but just make sure that you know, like, how does it fit within your philosophy? Like, what are you trying to do? What works within your community? Um, how can this data potentially add and have everybody in the mix, right? Make sure your practitioners are first and foremost at the table, um, have some athlete advocates or operator advocates for it and just get their perspective on it. Like, how can this help you or form factor questions or logistic questions? Because again, that's who we're trying to help is like, got to make sure this information is useful to you. Like they might, they might not know, like, oh, how, how can this, um, you know, motion capture movement assessment helped me. So that's where, again, when that conversation comes in to say like, hey, you should be aware of this. But I think it's it's no longer like just buy all of the things and work backwards. It's like, yeah. let's make sure we have good reasons to do it. When it comes to kind of this five sensor monitoring uh, for human performance, do you see when at least maybe with your research and validating the technology, is there a difference when you're validating technology for maybe a special operations community versus conventional military? sport or healthcare, or is it kind of the human body is the human body? We're not really going to worry about when the validation and it's more the context of how it's going to be applied. Yeah. So there is, uh, there are a couple answers to that one. Um, so it does matter because of the people making this, the decisions, right. Especially the most severe version of that is like healthcare versus, um, like personal training or something. Right. So that, I mean, that's, that's where like, life and death decisions based on that data versus this is kind of neat type data. Um, but really what that comes, like that has nothing to do with how valid the technology is, um, but that has to do, um, and this is kind of a plug that should hit people's LinkedIn, hopefully in a month or so. Uh, we did this a little bit when I was at West Virginia, but we're gonna kind of refresh it is uh, for all of these different settings, how accurate is accurate enough? And like, you know, as a practitioner and other people hopefully on this call know as practitioners, like okay, you're a practitioner, first and foremost, but you're a practitioner in this community. So taking all of that into account, um, and these are conversations that we've had with a lot of people, like theoreticals, like, okay, if you work with operators, if that operator is sitting in front of you um, and has this information, like how accurate does that have to be for you to make a decision off of that information? And that's what I'm hoping to get to with the survey study is, like, can we come to a consensus with enough responses? Like do strength coaches, in general thing, like a heart rate monitor, like for you to make a decision in a practice, like how accurate in number of beats per minute does that device need to be for you to make a decision? And then team docs, like take their context and like, not only guessing, but I would imagine they're gonna want to be a lot more accurate than, than that. So I think that's where the difference is as far as like how accurate does it need to be? So we run these validation studies and we'll report the data and we'll give you the error bars, but there's nothing telling you like what's right like, which one should I pick? Like, what error bar is good enough and what error bar is not good enough? Um, I mean, we have general rules and statistics where we, um, in our papers, it's like uh, mean average percent error or mate value. Like, in general, it's pretty well accepted that you want that 10% or below. Um, Lens concordance is another one that, like, we've got values. But it all, it, there also is a little bit of a art to that as well because you have to kind of look at that and, like, okay, you know, is that percentage... And that's where it takes conversations with practitioners. Like we take something like uh, body composition and 
percent error in body composition. Like I want to talk to a dietitian to figure out like what's actionable for you. Like, do you need it to be this accurate? And usually that conversation starts with like, do you realize how much error is associated with the measurement you currently have? And like, nothing is a hundred percent pristine, but like, are you aware? Like it's already this error bar is already here. And if you're looking for changes that are here, um, that's going to be tough. So I think that's the first, the first thing is how accurate does it need to be? The, the second thing is, um, you know, we run validations, you know, in the lab in pretty controlled settings using a reference that we trust, and, but that's in pretty controlled settings. So that, but that's the baseline that's repeatable, controllable, publishable. And then what we encourage groups to do, and we, we try to help them with that as well, a lot in the tactical community um, is let's figure out for your application, because I'm not going to be able to test every application. I can't test every sport, every operator, everything that they're doing. It's like, hey, you guys know your training events. Here's an easy replicable validation you can do yourselves. Um, like heart rate's a great example. Uh, like ad nauseum, there's so many papers that show Polar is incredibly accurate. So we use Polar as our reference device. Um, so we can very easily set up a tactical group with, uh, you know, $90 polar straps and a way to easily grab data. And if you have some prototype technology or something, go to your training event the way you do it in your conditions. And then here's some easy stats for you to like pull that data very cheaply, very scalably, and then show you the quick statistics of like, okay, now how well do you trust it in your environment? Um, so we're really just trying to create those tools so you can again, just take the stigma out of it. Like it doesn't have to be a hardcore scientific study. We can say like, hey, try to do this many trials, this many subjects in your environment, do some quick stats. And then, then you can kind of figure out. So I think that's kind of where it's going to differ in those settings. Like make sure it's like start, start with something that you think is already accurate, but then test it in your environment to make sure that that holds true. Because you're not, you're absolutely not going to find a, a, sign, a peer reviewed publication that you very unlikely that is going to be exactly your population tested in the situation even if it's sports yeah. like ice hockey i'm not i'm probably not going to find a heart rate validation study in ice hockey for division one athletes but yeah uh kind of going on that and i think probably a lot of people why they all wanted to come listen to you talk today they want to hear you know what what do you like can you provide three or four maybe examples of tech that you've tested and kind of what the validation was for that type of tech. So, you know, you talk about body comp, you talk about polar, are there ones that you feel comfortable speaking about saying maybe ones that you love that you think, well, right now you said you're agnostic that look promising and ones that maybe um, you were, you were surprised by, but maybe not being as promising as they were, um, you know, put off. Yeah, for sure. And um yeah, we've got a couple of publications. Also, I'll speak a little bit more to the ones we have publications on, um, but we've got a, a few more coming out as well. Um, but again, these are all commercial products and these are all things that we're, you know, will either are in the public or will be in the public. I'll break it down maybe in a couple of different categories. So that hopefully what will resonate to the end is heart rate. That was kind of the, the big, I don't know, the big thing four or five years ago is like every wearable with something glowing off the back of it is yeah. optical measurement of heart rate. So that's now pretty standard across all wearables is heart rate on your wrist. Um, obviously it would be great. If that's pristine um, because I know like, you know, athlete or operator or service member wants to throw on a, a heart rate chest strap on top of it. Um, really what all of our studies have shown, and this is now like thousands and thousands of exercise sessions. And so we look at it two different ways. We'll look at it from, I'll kind of start with the, the live heart, heart rate monitoring. So if you're an athlete operator, that is, that is doing heart rate zone training. Um, for sure, you have to have a chest strap to to ensure that you have accuracy of because in that case you want within one beat per minute accuracy at all times. Um, wrist devices, like in general, are getting better, but um, you know we can see on a session basis. So you do an hour run, like and you get your average heart rate, your min, and your max. Uh, for wrist based devices, they're almost all like you know they could be anywhere from ten to twenty percent error on like an average beat per minute for a session. So again, it, it's about your intent, right? So if you just want to yeah. know generally how hard was that session? Was that a really hard session? Was that a really easy session? Something in the middle, then risk-based monitoring is probably okay for you in that, that session basis. Um, our data showed like they're all pretty similar. Um, we did see some pretty uh, uh, good results with iWatch versus some of the other ones. Um, a lot of it comes down to, again, that testing yourself <clears throat> because like even with products like Garmin and Polar, uh, we still see that kind of like 20, 10 to 20% error. 
but we see some subjects and you know some people that it's pristine like it is it's dead on and i don't know why that is um we've done a little bit of uh kind of looking at like skin tones and wrist circumference and there's nothing nothing pointing to one area of that so i think that's where again just setting the end user up with a couple simple experiments against a chest strap just to know like are you one of those people where it's really accurate yeah um, but still i would say like heart rate zone training you still have to have a chest strap because even some of the ones that are pretty good on a session basis like they'll be wild and you like everybody's probably seen this a little bit on their own data like wild like you could be like 190 when you're clearly at 110 and then it yeah. stabilizes and then it's okay so if you look at that from a session basis the number might be okay but a momentary assessment like and that's gonna that's where you kind of lose trust from your athletes and operators too like if they see wild things like that you know like this is garbage i'm not using it um i would say the one outlier to that chest strap scenario is we tested the polar verity which is the armband um that one is like uh, extremely accurate and we we published that in a paper last year um and that's one where you did more like tactically relevant movements in the lab of mm -hmm. rocking and high intensity stuff um that was the one that surprised me um a being on the upper arm which way way back in the day like one of the first wearables i forget the name at this point they had the upper arm um, and they found that that was like a, a really good physiological location for getting high quality heart rate um and that's what we see with uh the polar verity and then we did a um testing with the with the whoop because the whoop you can take it out of your wrist and they've got like an arm arm version okay. and we saw much improved accuracy switching it up there then it becomes yeah. a logistics issue like with with that one it's like okay you got to take this thing off you got to unstrap it you got to put it in this armband you got to throw it in there so my question then is like what type of person would go through those additional steps and then put it back in the other one just to ensure they have higher quality data i hope everybody but that probably isn't the case so yeah yeah so kind of to kind of recap risk-based heart rate um from a session basis if you just want to know generally how hard or how easy that was which you probably know in your head already uh, wrist is okay for live chest strap but then the polar verity is really good on the arm as well so that's heart rate stuff uh, but then additionally those devices are going to give you calories burned um and we've done some preliminary testing with a metabolic cart we're seeing the same thing where it's like 15 to 20 percent error in calories burned so i same thing with like and that's even with accurate like even with a chest strap heart rate um and it's all algorithm based um so saying i would i would give the same advice for that one like if you just generally want to know did I burn 3000 calories or 1000 calories? That's fine. Um, if you want to do like specific calorie in, calories in, calories out, like to the calorie, you're not, it's going to get you in the yeah. right direction, but it's not, it's not going to be exact, right? Um, sleep. Uh, so I would say, and this, uh, this is research that my lab has done and that some DOD labs have published as well. Um, and a NHRC has done a, a phenomenal job of this in some of their publications where um, the consensus as I read it, um, and I've heard some briefings as well, is so the standard for sleep is a sleep lab, which you only go to if you think you have apnea or, or some issue and that's very uncomfortable. Um, the next level up from that, the researchers used was like a Phil, Phillips actigraph um, type thing that's very standard in research, uh, very end user unfriendly, good for research, like nobody would ever buy one and, and use it for that. Um, but it was it was trusted. Um, now pretty much every commercial wearable is outperforming the actigraph for simple duration metrics of the time you got into bed, the time you got out of bed, the amount of time you were actually asleep. Um, so that's like your sleep efficiency is that the ratio of those two things. So that's kind of my, my personal opinion consensus based on the literature is like pretty much every commercial wearable is going to get you a good start in that efficiency and time in bed. But you, if you think about the things that you actually have control over, um, you generally have control over what time you go to bed and what time you wait. Like I know there's demands and there's travel and other things like that, but like those, those are things you can actually make changes um, mm -hmm. to implement. You can't, you can't say I'm going to get more deep sleep tonight. Um, yeah. and like, like do that, right. That that's kind of magic, but you, so we got to fix those things first. So again, in general, these, these devices can get you in the right direction as far as like dialing in your circadian rhythm and even that sleep efficiency that we can trust in most devices now that's important because like then you have to start making those mental links in your head of like if i got bad efficiency last night was there something different like did i eat late was i stressed out my mind racing was the temperature off of my room um so i think that's actionable data um so that's the duration on the sleep uh now pretty much every sleep sensor has sleep physiology as well which i think is super cool 
Um, that's not like your average heart rate across the entire night of sleep, average heart rate variability, temperature and respiration rate. Um, and these are getting a lot better. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've got publications that show that Aura is very, very high quality data in that regard. So that's why we, we use that for a lot of our research studies. Um, but I would say they're all like, uh, they're all fairly acceptable for resting heart rate. Um, they're all generally accept acceptable now for heart rate variability, which I'm pretty excited about. Respiration rate's still a little bit all over the place, um, plus I'm not sure exactly what to do with respiration rate as far as links of that to performance. Um, but I think that's the good news is the resting heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, what I would say about that though, is like, that's just an average value throughout the night, which is like, it's great that we can now get that out of a number of consumer devices. Uh, there's a lot more going on in sleep though. Like it's a lot more complicated than your average resting heart rate at night. So I think it's a great start. Um, but that's some of the work that we're doing is like truly how restorative was that sleep last night? Because if you look mm -hmm. at your, like I've got pristine, you know, EKG all night, um, heart rate data. If you actually look at what's going on with your autonomic nervous system throughout the night, it is not like you would think like, Oh, I'm going to have this gradual, nice parasympathetic increase throughout every night. That's not what happens. Like it ebbs and flows. And I, I don't know why that is. I'm sure there's physiological reasons for that. Um, but I, I just say that because I think we're in a, it's a, we're starting out in a great place, uh, but there's a lot more to be done um, kind of on that side. Uh, some other testing that we've done is the like body composition. Like now there's scales you can jump on, um, which logistically are, are very advantageous price wise. They're pretty good. Like if you take a DEXA, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars. Some of these scales are like 15 to 20 K. Um, we just published a paper with AFRL um, a few months ago and just showing that those, like even the $20,000 scale is, you know, kind of unacceptable values. Um, and that's again, where that dietitian uh, discussion comes in because we, you know, we're showing anywhere from like 15 to 20%, not, not body fat, but like your the average of so the percent of the percent. Um, but again, that's kind of in our unacceptable range. But then even if you think about it, if you're trying, if you're a dietitian, you're looking at changes over time, like what's a rational change you could expect in four weeks or eight weeks is probably at one or 2% potentially. Mm -hmm. um, that's way in the like air bars are here. Like that value yeah. is like so small, like you will never pick that up. Um, yeah. And then uh, doing some, I want a PhD student, my group's doing some motion capture validation now that he's finishing up for his dissertation and publication. But that, that one I think is an interesting space because traditionally motion capture is in labs that have like hundreds of thousands of dollars of cameras and you put all the movie markers and stuff on you um great data but like never practical for a mm -hmm. assessment um so now there's technologies that are doing markerless motion capture um so he's uh processing all that data now um so we'll have that publication out in a couple months of looking at a couple different markerless systems um i think there's some there's some potential there um but again knowing kind of the athletics and dod environments like again that's got to be a quick assessment you take big services, you probably got to be able to do like 10, 20, 40 people at a time. So again, first step is validation. Second step is like, okay, if things are valid, how do we scale it? Yeah. Um, and get that to work. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where we're at now with um, a lot of different wearables validation. So I definitely see face validity in my aura ring when I drink a few beers and then go to bed, <laughs> my resting heart rate's high, my yeah. respiration's <laughs> high, my HRV is low. So if there's, you know, I can validate that by myself <laughs> and I wake yeah, up. Yeah. And that's what we're trying good. to do is like yeah. help people make, make exactly what you just did. Like, how do I yeah. help make you intuitive about your data? I see the same thing. Like if I do uh, poor nutritional choices before bed, like just seeing my heart rate is like, man, my body's doing a lot of work to deal with yeah. all that dumb food I ate and then it gets down. So again, it's life. We're human beings. We're going to yeah. enjoy things. Just, just know the impact of yeah what you're doing and get back at it. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely use it for behavior change modifications, just, you know, to continue to hopefully age well now that I'm older. <laughs> yeah, um, age backwards. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what we kind of talked about the limitations and the, the error that we're kind of seeing with some of these, and you kind of talked about the validation piece. Is, are there any advancements in that HP technology that you see some exciting trends? Uh, you kind of maybe talked about motion capture there. Are there some other trends? You're like, wow, this is going to be a pretty cool space in five years from now. Yeah, probably what I'm most excited about um, is the like, continuous glucose monitors. Um, it's really neat. Like there's a handful of companies commercially now, like Levels and NutriSense and Cygnos, uh, because they're not, so it is a 
very high quality product because unfortunately diabetes is a multi-billion dollar, you know, healthcare issue. Um, but what's neat about that is like these devices are not like, of course, like game changing for diabetes care. Um, but it's absolutely like, this is, um, molecular accountability. Like you can't hide from this data. It's super intuitive. You and I were talking about it before this, like, again, it's trying to put the power in your hands. Um, but I, I think just like, I think they nailed the form factor, you know, way you know, 10 years ago when I was in DOD labs, like we were trying to get after, you know, again, like hard, very hard challenges. Can we get continuous biochemistry, right? So back to the resting heart rate and heart rate variability, this is great that we have that, but the level of information you can get off of biochemical analysis versus some of these just, um, they're still kind of blunt instruments. Like there's, if your resting heart rate's up, it could be due to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, even even with biochemistry, right? There's a lot going on, but now, now if we can reliably do glucose in real time without stabbing yourself in the finger um, and just like the wearability of these devices, like they've nailed form factor. Like it's this thing you just snap onto the back of your arm. You don't even feel it. It sticks for 14 days. I've been in 200 20 degree saunas and then cryo chambers, like it stays on the whole, like it hurts to take it off after 14 days. Like it's still yeah. stuff pretty good. Oceans, like all of that good stuff. So that's what I'm most excited about because like these exist, these are accurate. It can already induce habit changes. You can compare like different foods and how that affects to your personal metabolism, which is again, back to the individualization of all these things. Like every human being is different. Like we do not all react to the same things the same way, especially with nutrition. Um, so I personally use it as like, uh, it's been a huge habit changer for me because yeah. like I refuse to see a big spike. So like <laughs> I've been like, take it for what it's called, like I've been low carb and I've been making yeah. generally good choices. Um, it's just, so that's just helpful from a habit perspective. But then if you're like an athlete or an operator and you really want to dial things in and see how, like, how does this food affect me? How does this exercise affect me? Glucose is always also a great, great stress marker as well. Like mm -hmm. I, I've had times where I've, I've given talks and I've done other things that are like definitely perceptively uh, stressful to me. And I've, my glucose has gone up. I didn't eat or drink anything. So I think that's where it starts getting even more exciting is, like, but I think a step back is like, we have to have the context data as well. So like, you can't just sit back and look at glucose data without any information. Like yeah. if there was a big spike, like, did you just eat something or did something, or did you exercise or like my sauna spike looks exactly like, crushing a bag of Doritos, right? So <laughs> yeah. one of those things is a good thing, one of those things is a yeah. bad thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where we have to get, um, I don't know if it's more technologically advanced or, I mean, these devices are good at it, but it takes like, you're a human being, you have to interact and say, I just did this mm -hmm. thing. So maybe in the future world, it can like, these set, all these sensors can pick up your context and pick up your chewing food and like i don't know if you have special glasses that'll take a picture of what you're eating <laughs> yeah um but point being is like we have to have that information and, yeah you know i'm bought into it and i interact with my thing but not everybody's going to do that so how do we how do we cater to that so i think that's like from a sensor perspective um by far that's what i'm i'm the most excited about from a data analysis and, and utilization of data perspective um it's 100 percent about an end of one clinical trial for every human being in my eyes, because like, just to your um, example of like, you did something and this happened in your aura data. Um, that's a good descriptive, um, but how do we get these sensors to be even more smart than that? And we take a, you know, a high, a high performer that has like lots of training load data and has access to like every awesome recovery modality. Um, and this is kind of what we're doing with a couple of our sports right now, especially our women's hockey team, uh, like, phenomenal to national champs two years ago runners up last year like they uh were phenomenal like they this is part of their culture we had nothing to do with it um but they like they bought into sleep and recovery and you know the aura ring was one of the reasons why they were able to have that feedback and they like they took sleep very seriously and like night before games like my lord they were locked in on sleep and they like but they made that cultural decision and, and the data followed that so now what it's turning into is like awesome they got that down now they want to know like how well does each like we got firefly we have float tanks we have light beds we have all the stuff that they have access to now what's the right scenario for game day minus one game day plus one travel um like we know and this is a lot of work we did with your group like we know best practices and we know decision trees but now the potential is with this physiological information and context we can really dial into 
what's best for you. And then again, back to your individual response to these things, you'll also respond differently to recovery modalities. Like I'm, I'm a homer for bloat and photobiomodulation, all this stuff that we do studies to show that like statistically on average, these groups, like your stress goes down, your anxiety goes down, like all these good things happen on average. But if you go subject by subject, people respond differently. Like, yeah. you know, like some people freaking love float. Some people hate it. Some, yeah. Right. So I think getting to that, like what works best for your physiology is kind of one. But now that we've got tools like this, we can, we can start to understand that and understand that feedback loop of, okay, you did this thing, this happened in your physiology. We have all this information now to tie that together. And as any high performer, any practitioner knows, you know, like any high performer, like they're not just going to do one thing. They're going to do all the things they're going to do uh -huh. random orders. And like, if, if one's good, five's better. Um, but that's why we need kind of that end of one experience uh for that person to be able to make sense out of your own data and like again how do i put that power in your hands or ideally it's an, a practitioner speaking with an athlete or an operator and like setting a plan in place and that's what we're doing with women's hockey is like okay like preseason, like before the season we want to try to understand these things for each individual and then we can have an actual a plan in place based on science and data uh, and all that good stuff so that those are probably the things that i'm that are biggest on my radar that are i think they're both achievable, right? They're all, they're already here. Yeah. I mean, that's all that data is, it's amazing and kind of rolls into this next question and kind of rolls in with what's going on in society these days with chat GPT and everyone talking about artificial intelligence. Um, so what's the role you see with this big data analytics and artificial intelligence play in the interplay of vast amounts of data from biosensors and how to provide meaningful insight to improve performance? So like, that is a gigantic question there, <laughs> um, yeah. but you know, how do you see that artificial intelligence playing into kind of maybe looking at this data? I think it's critical, um, but I think in most situations, groups aren't ready for it. Um, mm -hmm. Like that is that's the most advanced. So like machine learning, the AI, like that's the most advanced button. That's also generally the most confusing one. Because you can then, and I'm not an expert by any means, but people in my department are like, you can have explainable AI, non-explainable AI, non-explainable ML, where just things happen and you get this black box of like, who cares your model? Um, definitely what we're finding in our research, both in the DOD and athletics is like, you have to, you have to do things well. So it, like all the way back before you even talk about the fancy, shiny AI and ML stuff, you got to do things right from square one like you have to you have to ensure you have high quality data and procedures and philosophy because you can if you don't have that in place and you just like i could click a button right now and run some machine learning models and probably don't know what i'm doing but I, i'll get an answer um but like hey if i don't know what i'm doing that answer is probably going to be wrong or not meaningful if the data is dirty it's that even I can know everything about ML, like, and that's what, like we've got machine learning groups where we have those conversations. Like, we have support scientists sitting with machine learning experts and we're talking them through, like, what does this data mean? But we've already proven that that's high quality data. So, and there's just so many ways to not get high quality data. Um, like, one very simple example is um, there's a, a DOD group that was doing just uh, physical performance assessments and it's in a big service and they do it all the time. And it's like, hundreds if not thousands of people that do it the same battery over time so they're comparing different groups together um and like maybe the training plans were different between the two or maybe they had perceptions of like this group is not good this group is really good and so they took that performance data and they found massive differences in that performance data therefore this is true this group isn't good as the other one but <laughs> what it turned out when you peel back the layer was the testing conditions were completely different like one group was sleep deprived came off like an all night training event and it was like 30 degrees in the morning and they did the test versus the other one had like perfect conditions. Yeah. So like where something as simple as writing down pull-ups or something like that, like you wrote that down accurately, but the context are different. So yeah, I say all that because we like, this is not sexy stuff. This is not sci-fi. This is like, we have to ensure that we have quality data. We have to mm -hmm. know descriptives about our groups, norms about our groups. Um, that's definitely what we found, um, you know, uh, I've got amazing scientists on my team, uh, Justin Merrigan and Jason Stone. I've done a ton of work in this area, especially in like principal component analysis of all things performance technologies and like how different uh, one sport is from another. Like we already know genders are very different, but like just a sport versus sport comparison of some of this data, especially like catapult GPS, like you get 8 million metrics across all of it 
question is like, which one should we look at and what's important? Well, you have to model that for your sport and you can do that, but you start with descriptives and norms and understanding game demands and then military translate the same way, like try to understand mission demands and, and pull it backwards that way, same philosophy. But then what does that data look like for your group? Um, and then if you take a sport, then it's position specific, especially football, like demands of a cornerback are so different than a nose tackle, right? So we have to understand those things. Um, but then once you get all of that and you you know you're looking at the right things, again, you could throw everything into a model, but if you have nonsense variables that don't make, like something that just doesn't make sense for a nose tackle to ever be looking at, um, it's not going to be actionable. Like you could get a model mm -hmm. and even know it goes into it, but if you can't do anything to modify that number, then uh, what are you trying to do? Um, and I think the, the last part of that is like, what's your outcome? Like, what do you, this is more to the philosophy of each group is like, what are you trying to, like in machine learning world, like what are you trying to predict? Mm -hmm. And then, so if it's uh, injury or performance, uh, that's why we do a lot of work in the athletic space is like we have defined performance, especially for sports that have millisecond times and repeated measures. Um, we just did a bunch of exciting work with our swim team because they're like, holy cow, we're sitting on a gold mine of performance data that we can trust. And so now we took aura data and that performance data to understand any any links between those two things. And can we get, obviously we'd like to be able to predict a race result, but what we really want to do is like um, figure out what are, what are the critical inputs that led to a good performance for that athlete? And then how do we back that out into education? And, you know, one of the things we found is like uh, the more sleep you got the night before a race, the more likely you were to get a PR in that race. Like this is not science fiction. That's something that makes sense, but actually seeing that data um, yeah. that's where we hope to like, now we have to, but that's like, now when you talk to a head coach or a commander or anybody else, like, and I've been in this room before and have been, uh, beat up pretty good for this because now I'm like, I'm giving you models of what happened in last season. And I, like, I've shown like, Hey, when this loss happened, we saw this in the data and I'm like, it doesn't help me right now. <laughs> that already <Yeah>. happened. <laughs> Get yeah. out of here. So it's, it's trying to tie it back to, to being like, these are, these are the things that like, if it is a model, like these are the things that are big features to your model but we want to make sure that those things that we select for that model are things that you can actually do something about and you can action and then so then say okay next season the plan could be like focus on this this and this um game day minus one and again it's not going to predict that you're going to win that game but it's going to at least hopefully stack the deck as much as it can yeah. physiologically going into that game yeah we have a kind of a, we have a question from um, one of the attendees and it's kind of uh goes with this um, so it kind of goes back to when you were talking about you, the technology is not there to replace the practitioner. Um, and so she, Caitlin asked, uh, what factors should tech manufacturers consider when thinking about giving data insights into performance devices versus just objective data that the practitioners can analyze on their own? So kind of like whoop and aura, you know, there's the raw data and then they kind of highlight it. Um, what are your thoughts on that um, in the, and for an individual person, but also for like a big context of an organization? for that behavior change? Yeah, this one's a tough one because I, I understand why, yeah, any wearable you have is going to give you a score. And uh, consume, I'm sure they did like market studies and stuff like yeah. that to like, everybody wants a score. And that's where I came, when I first met your command, that's why I came in blazing with that, like we're going to have a score. And again, that's it's yeah. too complicated because there is no one size fits all. Um, so I, I do have a problem with those like, readiness recovery scores because it's so complicated and there's so much that goes into it but i also understand like not everybody's going to want to know their arm ssd or know what it is and so we have to have like that blend of um what can what can the athlete or operator easily understand and what do we still feel comfortable with from a scientific value so i go back to um you know black boxes in general i don't love because they're just again there's it's too complicated to like model every human being with one single number if it's somewhat motivational and educational um that's okay but still like they're like back to those sleep scores and readiness scores and then we've done those like i can't validate which one's right because there's no measure to see yeah. what's right um what we have done is we've mapped like we've worn all the things simultaneously and it's shown that it looks like buckshot on a graph <laughs> they don't which is expected, right? They're black yeah. boxes. Um, you would at least expect like sleep scores to go in the same direction. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering this question at all, but I, I think it's back to like, uh, if we have validated assessments, so back to the sleep sensors, like, okay, if we know heart rate variability is accurate and reliable, 
the resting heart rate's accurate and reliable, and we know the units to that, then um, you know what are what's your value today versus your rolling twenty eight day average? Um, that's what I care about. I don't care what my HRV is versus yours. I care about what mine is against my yeah. norm and what what happened those days. So I think that's where the manu that's where I would like manufacturers to go. And some do an okay job of that, is showing your own trends over time. And, yeah. And those kind of things, but I would hope it would get more to that that z-score mentality or averages or percentiles or based on yourself, not based off of other people. Um, but again, like that in this consumer wearable space, like they're they're making most of their money off of like everyday like people just buying a device, right? They're just selling yeah. millions of that versus like selling to one specific athletic unit. To, so like yeah. I think maybe we could get a lot more precise if we we're just doing it for American football or something like that. But that's like yeah. too small of a market to to get after. So I hope that someone answered it, but probably ran around yeah. that one. No, no, no. Um and then uh, just another question came in from Joseph. Uh he asked, um, uh, do you see any issues taking this research to an operational military space, kind of like you've done. Um, so you've worked there, but given the concerns of tracking and electro electronic signatures, I know, like, how do you mitigate it or how do you kind of skirt that um, when you're working with these DOD groups? Man, of course <laughs> I didn't want to answer. I just like telling like how accurate the thing is and how usable it is. And yeah. I totally get it though. I mean, this is, this is real life and this is, this is the world. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in this space. I know Air Force Research Lab is doing a phenomenal job um, of getting into that space and understanding that, and other organizations are as well. Um, what I would say is the probably the safest and most effective place to utilize this information is in a training environment, like everyday environment, where you're just trying to dial in everything you can on a daily basis and understand the, you know, how all these things interrelate and how this again back to that end of one clinical trial. And again, this is what we do with our sports is like, let's learn as much as we can in that training phase. Um, and then in the military side, like once it gets to operations, um, and this is just from hearing some feedback from, you know, some different groups of like, and this is not consensus by any means, but it's like, I don't want to see that information when I'm in the middle of the mission, because it's not going to affect anything that I do. Like seeing my heart rate in the mission is not going to change the way I make a decision. It might just be, um, detrimental to, or it might just be yeah. more noise, right? It, Again, that may not be the case for everybody, but that's kind of my safest answer to that is like try to keep it in the training domain as much as possible and educational domain as much as possible. And then when you get into the real world, like let your intuition take over. So if you just, if you spend so much time or you just like you're, you're watching your heart rate when you're training and, and you just know, like some people probably know within a couple of beats per minute what it is because they have that constant feedback, like maybe let that yeah. take over when you're in that competitive environment. So last question here uh, to bring us up. Uh, so finally, what is your advice uh, for individuals, athletes, and organizations when looking to integrate biosensor technology into their performance optimization strategies? So, you know, what what are one or two nuggets uh, that you could provide us so that people walk walk out and they can go talk to the organizations about how we're going to integrate this type of technology? Yeah, I think there's two different two different ways to get at it. So if you have a extremely mature organization where like again, talking technology and data wise, like it's already there. It's part of the culture. It's implemented. Then it very much becomes a um, a technology scouting space where if there's a new tech that hits, and you check with your community and check with other people, like what do you know about this thing? Like if that thing then replaces a current technology, then it becomes a question about is it is accurate, reliable? Are there logistics advantages? Are there price advantages? And if all of those things are checked, and then it's just replacing something. Um, then it's, then it's a matter of like, it's not just as simple as replacing it. It is like, how do you merge that with your old data? And like, so you don't lose your old data and you know, yeah. all of that. And that's, you know, that, that's critical for a lot of technologies. That's if you're in a very mature space. So staying with that mature space, if there's some new thing that you're not currently capturing and this new technology comes out, I think since you're so mature in that decision-making process, it's okay to kind of work from product and implement it in there. If if and only if you talk to your practitioners and operators or athletes and does this provide an advantage to your day-to-day -day operations by having this information. And then again, it's that data accuracy, logistics, price. And logistics really is, is like how long does it take to get from measurement yeah. to actionable data? Um, now that the polar opposite of that is an organization where sports science is new and you have nothing or next to nothing. And that's where I think back to my comment of let's stop working from see a product or this 
this college has it. We should have it too. Maybe that's a good entry point to have a conversation, but it's not like we're going to buy it because they have it. Um, we've had this conversation a lot of times of like even technologies that we have embedded at Ohio State of like, we've got some people that are just using it. And usually the question is, is like, what are you going to do with that data? Are you going to make any decisions based on that data? And if the answer is a flat no, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Like it's not the end of the mm-hmm. world. Let's, let's not do it. But I think it's, let's not go from the product backwards. Let's go from a needs analysis philosophy. What are you trying to do? And then you can start kind of checking those things like, okay, this is what we're all about. This is our culture. This is how we think this thing can help. And then if it's load monitoring, then you kind of go through those step points. So I, I think it's just being honest about your philosophy and culture and where you're at um, and making the decisions from there. Cool. Well, Josh, I really appreciate we're coming up on the hour here. I really appreciate you finding some time to chat with us today and um, providing us with your expertise. And thank you so much for all that you're doing within the DOD space when it comes to validating all this technology for uh, the, our service members and the HP staff that support them. Uh, you'd really have helped us, at least helped me out and where I used to work. Um, and I, I, I know you're helping a lot of the people. So thank you so much for all you've done. And uh, you have a great evening or afternoon, I should right. say. <laughs> Bye. Appreciate thank it. you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.